Bible, please uh, raise your hands. Uh, Bill's got some Bibles there. Benny's got some Bibles over here. And just raise your hand. We'll get you a copy of God's Word. And if you have a uh, your Bibles with you, why don't you turn to John 16, and we're going to pick it up in verse 17. I'm going through uh, the series, reading the Reds, reading the words. Uh, that Jesus spoke to us here from earth. So, uh, I've entitled today's message, Joy in the Journey. You know, all of us are going on this journey that we call life. It's an individual journey for each and every one of us. Our life is an individual journey. When you were born into this world, there may have been doctors and uh, other people around, but you came in by yourself. And when we leave and exit this earth, there may be family members around, but you will exit by yourself. And as we go through this journey, although there are family and friends and people that we journey with, it's an individual journey with God. It's your relationship with God, and uh, it is you having that personal relationship with Him. That's an amazing thought. You know, you think that there are over 6 billion people on the planet, yet God can individually have a relationship with us that is so personal, that is so unique, and so special, and yet He can do that with everyone else. So life is this individual journey that we take with many different people and each chapter may see new people come and see old people go but Jesus is preparing us for that next chapter in our lives so we're gonna look at uh, letter A here the disciples asked what do you mean he's talking uh, Jesus was telling them telling him he's getting ready to go back to the father that he wasn't going to be here uh, forever. He says in verse 5, Now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? And so they start asking each other a question, and starting in verse 17, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And because I am going to the Father, and they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. And you ever notice, like, you know, you really want to ask the teacher a question, but you're kind of embarrassed, a little shy. You're kind of, well, this is going to sound stupid. And, and they're just kind of asking each other. I know he's telling us this, but we really don't know what he means. And Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking me or are you asking one another what I meant when I said in a little while you will see me no more. And then after a little while you will see me. And so the disciples have been asking this question, and I want to tell you that every future chapter of our lives is going to be shrouded with many uncertainties and unknowns that will usually cause us stress, anxiety, and worry in our lives. They had, couldn't imagine, really, that Jesus wasn't going to be there with them throughout the whole you know, entirety of their lives. They thought this journey was just going to keep on going. And when he was telling them, no, that's not the case, things are going to be different, I think they just kind of disconnected and they just it kind of blew over their heads uh, what he was saying, even though it was pretty plain to them. And so as you go through the journey of life and you're going into the future, it's going to be shrouded with uncertainty because we don't know what's going to happen to us this afternoon, what's going to happen to us tomorrow, next week, next year, and that can create stress in our lives. In 1 Corinthians 13, it says this, For now we see through a glass darkly. 
You know, we don't see perfectly all the things that are taking place in the days to come because they haven't taken place yet. Now, for the disciples, there was a constant. And Jesus was that constant. And you know, it didn't matter where here was, as long as Jesus was there, he was that constant for them. They knew that it was going to be all right. Wouldn't uh, you love to have that kind of constant in your life? A solid rock, a firm foundation, where every problem every trial, every test, you knew that uh, where to turn, who to turn to, where were they going to find food for all of these people? The disciples were asking themselves when there was five to 10,000 people on the hillside in a remote place where there was no possibility. That was a question that really did not have a answer to it. And so they come to Jesus Hey, we got to send them away because there's no food here. And Jesus says, oh, well, you give them something to eat. Well, all we have are a few loaves and two fish. And he says, that's okay. And he solved their problem. He was able to answer uh, the things that were going on uh, in their lives. Every problem that we face, Jesus has an answer to it. How about when they were out on the sea and the storms were raging and they, these were seasoned fishermen who were scared to death. They thought they were going to drown and that night they were going to die. So they woke Jesus up and yet Jesus was able to calm the storm. He had the answer for their problems. You have financial problems when Peter couldn't pay the temple tax and Jesus told him, hey, just go fishing and you catch that fish and the uh, $20 gold piece is going to be in its mouth, every problem in their life uh, was answered by Christ. And the future for us is always shrouded in that uncertainty. We have all the ideas of what life might be like, what we'd like to do, but every plan can come to a screeching halt. Have you noticed that? This past week... Um, there was a, uh, a well-known uh, author, journalist, Pulitzer Prize winner, Charles Krauthammer. Uh, he died this past week. He was a contributor on Fox News. And uh, if you've ever seen him on TV or read any of his work, when he was 22 years old, he was going to med school. He was going to Harvard. And I mean, you know, I don't check out guys, but he was a good-looking guy. I mean, he was tall, he was strong, uh, handsome, uh, you know, had a, uh, just a great uh, way about him. And uh, he's going to Harvard, he's going to med school, you know, brilliant guy. And he and his buddy skipped uh, school one morning. They wanted to go play tennis. And after uh, tennis, they uh, came by a pool, and they were taking a few dives to go in. And his last dive, before they went back into class, Charles uh, went down and he didn't come up. He said he hit the uh, pool floor at the right angle, at the right whatever, and it severed his spinal uh, cord. And uh, at the age of 22, he's lying there at the bottom of the pool, and he knew instantly his life had changed. And so for the next 40 or 50 years, you don't know what is going to happen the next day or the next year in your life. For uh, those who know Johnny Erickson Tata, same thing. I mean, I'd be a little hesitant now to go diving in pools and things like that because she was in a diving accident and she became a quadriplegic also. Same thing. But God was able to use and to redeem those things. So you can get one diagnosis from the doctor. You can get one pink slip from the office. You can get one sickness in the family, and everything in your life can change. One bad investment that you make in your life, and it can change everything in your life. And so for a short window of time, the uncertainty of the future didn't matter. Can you imagine? Because Jesus is the answer. There was not a sickness that he could not cure, and the disciples knew it. 
There was not a financial problem that Jesus could not solve. There was nothing that they would deal with that Jesus could not fix. You remember Peter's mother-in-law, she was sick, lying on a couch. Jesus comes in, he just grabs her hand, and all of a sudden she becomes totally whole and well. She was renewed with energy. She just got up and started waiting on the disciples because she had all of this energy. She was ready to go, been lying around long enough. Jesus had the answer for every problem that they had. Those three and a half years must have just flown by. And just when the party was getting kicked into high gear, they were hearing that the party was coming to an end. I know none of y'all hang out at the bar, but if, uh, for those of you who may have heard, you get the last call, you know, before they're going to shut it down, and uh, you're just having a great old time, and all of a sudden you hear, hey, it's last call. You know, we got to get up, we got to go. Well, for the disciples, that's what was happening. They were getting the last call. Call. Hey, I'm leaving, and it must have felt like it was only been a minute uh, while he was there, and yet it was time for him to go. And so Jesus said, in a little while, you will see me no more. And they're asking him the question, well, where's he going? What's he going to do? And why can't we come with him? You know, we're his friends. And they really thought in the back of their mind that somehow that they were always going to be with him, through this entire journey of life. And a future without Christ is no future at all. The journey would be meaningless. So Jesus gives them this next bit of news. Let's look at letter B. He said that we will mourn while the world rejoices. Let's look at verse 20. He says, I tell you the truth, while uh, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. And so obviously the disciples would be devastated when Jesus was tortured and crucified. Their hope and their promise was dashed to pieces. I mean, they really mourned. They wept. I believe they were numb, disillusioned about everything that had just happened. That would be the natural response of the disciples. But why would the world rejoice in response to what happened to Christ? Do you remember on the day of 9-11, for America, it was a great day of mourning. It was incredible sadness. Not only had 3,000 people died, uh, there was this sense of uncertainty And there was, for a long time, this shock and disillusionment. But do you remember over in Tehran, in the Middle East? I mean, they were having parties. They were having celebrations uh, because all of these uh, people had died and because of uh, this attack that came. There was a total different response. And so when Jesus died and he was crucified... He said the world was rejoicing. And they were rejoicing, why? Over a man who brought good news, who healed and helped so many, who never tried to injure or hurt someone. Have you ever wondered why some people take delight in your misfortune? If you lose your job, if your marriage isn't going so well. If there's struggles in your life, people are gleeful because of your misfortune. You know, in the Old Testament, King David, out of all the people that, uh, all the kings uh, of the Old Testament, if you asked anyone, any Jewish person, probably any Christian, who was the greatest king of the Old Testament, they would probably say King David. And there really wasn't much of a close second. And listen to what King David, now here's this guy, a man after God's own heart, uh, you know, a special time in Israel's history, and this is what so many people around David said about him in Psalms 69. He said, those who hate me without reason, 
They don't hate me because of all the stuff I've done. He says, those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs on my head. Many are my enemies without cause. Those who seek to destroy me, I am forced to restore what I did not steal. I mean, he's uh, constantly under pressure. He's having to return stuff that he didn't even take because he's been accused of different things. He says, for I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my own mother's sons. Even his brothers within his family were jealous of him, and they couldn't say a kind word about him. He says, when I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. So here he is. He's really crying out to God. He's weeping. He's brokenhearted. And the people around are just kind of snickering and making fun of him. Uh, He's being scorned. When I put on sackcloth, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me, and I am the song of drunkards. Now, that doesn't sound like that's good for your self-image and self-esteem. Can you imagine that he's going around and he knows that all of these people are saying these things about him? The world will rejoice in your misfortune because the world is living in darkness. The world rejoices because it lives and dwells in darkness. There is a negative energy that eats away at your soul. Be careful. Be careful. We are surrounded. We are consumed by a darkness that goes around the world. You see it everywhere. You see it on TV. You'll see it in the neighborhood. You'll see it within your family. And that negativity, that darkness is going to try and eat away at your soul. It builds itself up by trying to tear others down. It is a part of a demonic realm. And so that's why they were rejoicing as Jesus was being crucified. People living in darkness can only build themselves up by tearing people in the light down. They think that they can light their candle by putting yours out. I mean, I'm sure you don't know anybody like that, right? I mean, the world is full uh, of those examples. That's why God hates gossip. Gossip is finding out some bad news about somebody and going and telling everybody else. You're gossiping about their misfortune. You're gossiping about their sin or a problem that they're going through. God hates slander. Slander is talking about somebody else, something that they had not even done, something that is untrue about them. God hates all of those attitudes, rejoicing in an enemy's destruction. You know, something bad happens to somebody you don't like, and you're so happy about that. The Bible tells us, do not rejoice or do not look down on your brother's misfortune. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, so it will be done to you. And so we need to be careful about all the negativity that goes on in the world, all the darkness that goes on in the world, because it's trying to get into our hearts, into our souls, who we are, who are Christians. And so you remember the story of Jonah. Jonah resisted at every turn to see good come to Nineveh. I mean, he just simply, he was, a, he was a great prophet of God. He had a great gift. Uh, God was able to speak to, you know, to these prophets. He could tell them about something in the future, and they knew that they knew that they knew that this was going to come true, and uh, it was like you know, reading the, the yesterday's news. It was something that was a fact, and uh, when God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, He hated the Ninevites. I mean, they were like the Old Testament version of the Nazis to the the Jews because they persecuted them, they killed them, they tortured uh, the Jewish people, and he didn't want to see anything good come to those people. And so, of course, so he resisted. Instead of going to Nineveh, he went the opposite direction to Tarshish. 
and uh, he was trying to run from God so that God would not be merciful and bless uh, the people of Nineveh. And so they go through this whole thing, and God eventually, he uh, causes Nineveh to repent, and uh, they came in uh, sackcloth and ashes, and they repented. And these are the very last words that we read in the book of Jonah, because now Jonah is all upset because God saved this big city. And God says this. He says, hey, Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. And I think it's kind of interesting that he throws that in. You know, there's not only 120,000 people, But he says, you know, and there's all of these, God created all the things on earth. He created all the birds, he created all the bees, he created all the fish, he created all of our pets, our dogs, you know, the ones that you love. God cares about every animal. He was caring about all of those cattle. The Bible says he sees every sparrow that falls. And so he says, there's 120,000 people there. Should I not be concerned about that great city? And what I'm trying to say here is when you think about God, when you think about who he is, he's not the guy who was there just waiting to smite you every time that you make a mistake. You like that word, smite? You know, you make a mistake and boom, he's going to lay the hammer down. Hey, the Bible says that God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. I like that kind of God that's going to have mercy on me. And so God did not want to destroy this city, even though... They were so wicked, he could easily have done that. And so God is looking for that mercy. The Bible tells us that it's not God's will that any should perish, but all to come to repentance. That's the heart of God. And uh, as uh, as the world is uh, rejoicing over the misfortune, over the sin and the death uh, of Jesus and his followers, hey, the people of Christ we are weeping. The world wants to see you fail because the darkness is where that energy comes from. That's why the Bible says that the enemy, he is a thief. He's come to rob, kill, and destroy. Don't fall into that trap. When you let evil come out of your heart and mouth, you're allowing the devil to take possession of your soul. That's your mind, your will, and your emotions. If you get stuck in a place of constant negativity, constant uh, resentment, bitterness, judgment, all those things that are going on, taking away your peace, the enemy is trying to get into your soul. The Bible says this, Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so don't harbor that resentment. Don't harbor that bitterness or anger or jealousy. It only imprisons you. Did you realize that? When you're angry at somebody and you're holding this unforgiveness, this root of bitterness, whatever it is, the only person sitting in prison is you. That's why the Bible tells us, forgive us our trespasses. Amen. How? as we forgive those who trespass against us. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I can't forgive that person. Oh, are you certain? Because God over here, there's all of this sin that you and I have done and have caused, and he's saying, I can't forgive you your sins, only as you forgive your brother's sins. Forgive us, we're asking God, we want God to forgive us our sins, Does anybody don't don't want God to forgive them their sins? Hey, forgive us our sins. How do we want God to forgive us our sins? As we forgive those who sin against us. Hey, 
I don't mind forgiving anybody their sins against me as long as I know God is forgiving me my sins because my sins are a greater debt than the sins that anybody has caused against me. My sins against God. And so that's where the freedom comes from. The enemy is going to try and trap you into hanging on to unforgiveness towards someone else, to bitterness towards somebody else. That is the trap of the enemy, and God won't be able to set you free until you ask to get out of jail, to you ask to get out of prison. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen. And there's the battle that's going on. And you yes. can see people who have been just uh, overwhelmed, taken over by sin or by a root of bitterness. You can just see it in their countenance. You can see it in their life. It's not a good place to be. When the kingdom of God suffers, the world rejoices. It's always been that way, but there will be a day of reckoning. God will take care and balance out all the scales. Now, Jesus explains the purpose for the pain and suffering that we are experiencing in verse 21. We're all going through this process, but you need to know that there is a purpose behind it. It's not just to suffer till we get to eternity. God is doing something in our lives. Let's look at the joy, the joy part of the journey. It's, the journey is not just to suffer through. The journey will bring us joy in the uh, process. And so the new birth explains our anguish. Let's go ahead and pick it up here. Let me start back in verse 20. He says, I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. And so Jesus gives us this picture. He gives us this analogy of what the pain and suffering that we're going through right now is like and the purpose of that on the other end. Now think about this. Every day, every hour, around the clock, from almost, probably almost to the beginning of time, someone, some girl has been giving birth somewhere. And God watches every baby that comes into the world. Isn't that an incredible thought? Thinking about God seeing right now, you know, Memorial Hospital and at Cleveland Clinic and wherever else babies are being born, that God is there present watching this new life come into the world. And Jesus is explaining the journey in this life as a spiritual process of a child, us, being born again. Now, in the natural childbirth, you know, a seed has to be planted into the woman that causes a hormonal change in her life. And the woman's body goes through this physical transformation. I mean, it's really nothing short of miraculous every time that that happens. From the moment that that seed is conceived, the hormones, the whole body begins to change. You know, and the morning sickness and all the other things. The body is going through this transformation because it's now going to host another body. It's going to host another person uh, that is going to be birthed inside of them. And so inside and outside, mm -hmm. what happens with a couple when they find out that they're pregnant? You know, they have baby showers, they get the, the room ready, they get the crib, they get the car seats, they get the clothes. Uh, they do all those things, get the toys ready to uh, bring this child into the world. I mean, that is just the natural process that goes on. And from the moment of conception, the focus and plans consist, uh, consciously and subconsciously become about planning and caring for this new child that is growing inside of her. Now, let me just stop and ask you. 
So this girl is pregnant, and she's going to have this baby, but she decides, or maybe the couple decides, you know what? We want to keep living just the way that we were living. We want to be able to go out anytime that we go out just like we did before. We don't want to have all of this extra stuff in our lives. You know what we would call that? We would call that bad parenting, right? Amen. Hey, you're now responsible for this child. Your life has now changed because this child is coming into the world. Now think about that in your spiritual life. From the moment our spiritual conception took place, when we were born again, the Father, what does He do? He introduces His seed into His bride. That seed is the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in Corinthians, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. The Holy Spirit begins this hormonal, spiritual change inside of us. Amen. Do you see the difference? The difference between a relationship with God is not, I'm changing over a new leaf. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to follow the Ten Commandments. I'm going to add a few more things to my life. No, this is a total transformation of the person. Just like a woman uh, getting ready to give birth. There's going to be a total transformation in her life. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. And do you ever really wonder what happens or what was really happening when you accepted Christ and became a Christian. Your thoughts begin to change. Your attitudes begin to change. Your physical countenance will begin to change. The whole person goes through this transformation in their life. The new birth consists of two baptisms. First, there's that baptism of water, where the Bible talks about the washing of the water of the Word. That's what happens, is that the Word begins to transform our soul, our mind, our will, Hallelujah. our emotions. You know where we used to lie before? All of a sudden, man, I'm under conviction. I cannot lie to this person anymore. I'm being, going through this transformation in my mind. Do you hear what I'm saying? Amen? Amen? So there's this transformation that's taking place, a renewed mind. The evil thoughts, the evil way of living is being washed away. And second, there is the baptism of fire. Trials that will bring you to the breaking point. You know, fire and water are two forms of cleansing. You can cleanse by fire, you can cleanse by water. Isn't it interesting in the Old Testament that when God destroyed the world the first time, He cleansed it by a global flood by water? And the Bible says at the end times, it's going to be cleansed with fire at the very end and so the same thing is happening in our lives we're going to go through trials there's going to be fires in our lives that are going to change and transform us those things that cause stress those things that cause anxiety and fear we have to trust in God as we go through that Amen. but don't forget that the Holy Spirit is your epidural. Everybody want an epidural when they're getting ready to give birth? You know what I'm saying? Changes and transforms the whole thing. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Doesn't the Bible say that He will give us peace that passes all understanding? Man, you're going through this trial in your life and you should just be flipping out and all of a sudden there is just this incredible peace that comes over you, and you know that it is the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible tells us that He will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on Him. And so we have the Holy Spirit who is just baptizing us in His Spirit, giving us that peace, the purpose of the journey. Now, let me just stop there for a second, because when I started uh, the message, I was talking about what it would be like for us uh, as disciples, you know, that they're with Jesus for three years, and he was the constant. 
They knew that there was not a problem, right? Wouldn't you like to be there? There's not a problem in your life that you knew that he could not solve. Come on. And Jesus said, it is good that I go. Why? Because if I don't go, I will not be able to send the Holy Spirit. Amen. That Holy Spirit is that same constant in our life. The Bible says that it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So it still does not matter what's going on in your life. Is there a problem that God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit cannot solve in your life just like Jesus did 2,000 years ago? There's not a problem. There's not a sickness. There's not a trial. There's not a tribulation that you can go through that the Holy Spirit, He is not there. That He is completely in charge of all circumstances in your life. And we need to have that assurance. We need to have that walk with him that when we go through trials, we're not looking here, there, and everywhere first. Our first place to go is on our knees to God, asking him and let the Holy Spirit begin to do his work because I'm telling you that God already knows the answer to your problem. You just have to ask him first. The scripture I gave you last week, before they call, I will answer. You remember the story there of Esther. He already had a problem worked out about Haman destroying all of Israel, even before Haman even thought about destroying Israel. He was already working out those problems uh, in their life. And the same thing now. You've got situations maybe that you're currently going through, or you've got situations that you may be going through that you don't even know about, and God already knows about it, and He is already working out the people, the places, the situations, all the circumstances that you need in your life in order when you get there and you call on Him, He's going to say, well, before you called, I already answered. I already knew that you were going to call me, and so I already FedExed your answer to you. You know what I'm saying? Say amen. That is the God that we serve. And the purpose of the journey that we are on is to eliminate that old person, that crucifying the flesh, uh, as Paul talked about, and give birth to the new man and that new creation. Paul was a pastor and an apostle. And for his church, he said this. He says, I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. He's seeing his flock, the churches that he was over. He said, listen, I see what you're going through. And it's like I'm going through these pains of childbirth till Christ is formed in you. Till you get it. Till you are able to call on God yourself and be able to get those answers that you need in your life. That's where God is bringing us through on this journey, when we call to Him. So, amen. Let's look at the uh, last point here. Uh, Letter B, the last verse. And this is the game changer. He says, no one will be able to take away your joy. Verse 22, letter B here. He says this. He says, so with you. Now is your time of grief but i will see you again and you will rejoice and here's the best part and no one will take away your joy isn't that great we can be in a place in our walk with the lord that no one no circumstance no trial in our life can take away the joy that's inside of us And unless we see the big picture, the purpose of the labor pains of this life and the joy of the eternal life to come, you will be overcome with the darkness of this world. So a woman understands all the processes, all the steps of childbirth, and she knows that these things have to happen in order for what? The end product to come, the baby, the child that she wants to bring into the world. And if you can see your problems in the same way, that we have to go through these things, Jesus said, in this life you will have tribulation, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. And so as we're going through the tribulation, we know that there is an end product. Are you with me? 
There is a birthing that's going to take place inside of us. Amen. There's going to be a new creation, which is us, that is being formed out of the fire, out of the tribulation, out of the things that we are going through. Amen. And he said, no one will be able to take away your joy. Now listen, I don't pretend to know or to understand you know, why a celebrity chef, Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade, who seem to have everything in the world going for them, what was going on in their heart and mind, and why they would abruptly commit suicide. I have no idea all the circumstances around it, but I can tell you this. People who lose hope and see no purpose in life will give up on living. Your hope and your purpose has to be found in Christ. Because if it's not found there, eventually you're going to say the same thing that Solomon told us thousands of years ago. He's going to say meaningless. It's all meaningless. Vanity, vanity. All of life is vanity. It's a chastening after the wind. But if you understand the bigger picture, if you understand where we're going and why we're on this road and what God is doing for us, in us, it'll give us hope, it'll give us joy that will not be able to be taken away from us. Amen. Before the people of, but for the people of God, our hope doesn't diminish, it grows, and when trials grow in your life, it's a reminder that a child of God, that I'm a child of God, that I'm a stranger and alien here on earth. You know what? I'm just passing through. Uh, this is not the last chapter. This is not the end of the road for me. I'm just on a journey. I'm going, and eventually I'm going to get to the place that God has for me, that eternal life with Him. That my hope is not in this life, but it's in the life to come. Now imagine in the hospital when a patient's heart flatlines. And at that moment, what happens to that person? You know what just happened? Every financial debt that they ever had has been wiped out. Every relationship problem that they were going through has been stopped. It has been solved. It is done. It's non-existent. Every burden, every care, and every problem in this life ceases at that one moment. What is it that you're carrying right now that is so big, that is so heavy, that in one second it can all be wiped away and gone? Hey, we're going through temporal problems, but God has an eternal answer for us. We don't have to worry about the things that we're going through right now because they too will pass away. Every burden, every care, and every problem in this life one day is going to cease. Now, I'm a personal uh, proponent of DNR. Do not resuscitate. Hey, when I'm out of here, I'm good. I'll see you later. Hey, this is what the Apostle Paul said in uh, 1 Timothy as he was getting ready to leave. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Amen. And not only to me, but to all those who have longed for his appearing. Do you see the hope that we have in that statement? Pete, uh, Paul knew. He said, hey, listen, I'm at the end of the road. I'm getting ready to go home. I have run the race. I have fought the good fight. There is laid up for me these treasures in heaven. I am ready to go from this place to the next place. There was a joy that could not be taken away from him because he knew where his hope was. And it wasn't just hoping in something, it was a reality that he knew, that he experienced, that he touched. And it was the same thing for the disciples. What must it have been like when they literally were there in the upper room behind locked doors and all of a sudden 
the resurrected, resurrected Jesus appears before them. I mean, they saw him tortured. They saw him crucified. They saw him put the spear through his side and the nails into his hands and all of that. And yet here he was. He had overcome the grave. When the disciples saw Jesus' resurrected body standing in the upper room, this was their response. What Jesus said, I will see you again and you will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. Would it be possible when you see Jesus resurrected, when they saw him, that there was anything that could take away their joy that they had? These men became invincible, indestructible, knowing even death had no hold on them. Do we live like that? Do we think like that? Do we believe like that? That, hey, if Christ is for us, who can be against us? Hey, it's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Where, O oh death, the Bible says, is your victory. Where, O oh death, is your sting. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So these guys saw it firsthand and knew that every fiber of their being that Christ had been risen and that they are going to be resurrected with him. So the normal pressures of the world that used to control these people no longer worked. Do you see where I'm going with that? The normal pressures of this world that they use against you to press you down, to depress you, to overwhelm you, they should not work on your life If you know that the resurrected Lord is alive and that we are going to spend eternity with him, that there's no problem that he can't solve, there's no solution, there should be joy in the journey. When you're going through a problem in your life, you should be saying, God, I'm excited to see the answer that you are going to bring through this. Not the depression and the overwhelming uh, uh, attack of the enemy. Well, you're never going to get through this one. This one's going to bury you. This one's going to kick you out of your house. This one's going to put you under a bridge. This one's going to take you down. Whatever it may be. Hey, that's not God speaking. That is the enemy trying to attack you. We are more than conquerors, the Bible uh, tells us. And so the pressures of this world to control us no longer work on the born-again, washed-in-the-blood believer who is walking with God. We must walk with Him. And we're like Peter. Once we take our eyes off the Lord, we begin to sink like any other person would. But if we keep our eyes on the Lord, He's going to sustain us through every trial. Jesus Himself. It says that it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, scorning its shame. You know, after the resurrection, uh, the world came against the disciples. The Sanhedrin called them in, the Pharisees. They rebuked them. They told them, hey, don't you preach anymore in the name of this Jesus. And they said, hey, we can't help but preach because we've seen his resurrected body. And so what they did was that they flogged them. You know, they beat them mercilessly. And, uh, you know, they they were beaten and they were kicked out of the Sanhedrin. And how would you feel trying to serve the Lord and all you got was ridicule and blame and, uh, you know, thrown out on the door and made fun of? Well, this was their response. It says that the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Hey, they knew that this was going to be counted to them as a treasure in heaven. They knew that the enemy wasn't going to defeat them. They could kill the body, but they could not kill the soul and the spirit inside of them. We have a power inside of us, that Holy Spirit who is deposited inside of us, who will carry us through every situation in our lives. Amen? Amen. 
Amen. You can't imagine why revival began to break out because these people were unchained. These people were set free, as Jesus said. Hey, let's go ahead and stand together. And we're going to close in prayer. And some of you are going through trials right now. And some of you have found out news that, you know, would be devastating in the natural. And you may be going through a situation. Pastor Paul, if you'll come on up. If you don't know the Lord, He's the one who will carry us through this life, through eternal life. If you need prayer, I'm going to ask you to come up. I want to be able to pray for you as the worship team sings.